Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. Welcome. Glad that you're here. If you're in Center Court East or again over in Center Court West, we're so glad that you're here. If you're online or on another screen, we're really glad that you're here today. So um, today is a day that I've been looking forward to, not just for all the costumes of the kiddos and candy and the kettle corn and the photo booths and all that fun stuff but because you're going to get to hear from my friend, Peter Pereira. Peter and I met and became friends, I guess about a dozen years ago. He is a missionary in India, evangelist in India, and it will take all of about five seconds for you just to pick up on the warmth of his spirit, and you'll start to get a sense for Um, what a powerful ministry God is doing in his life. I've asked him to share for the first three or four or five minutes just some of what's going on over there, bringing us an update since we partner together. And then he has a great message for all of us. And so really glad that you're here for Peter. Let's welcome Peter Pereira in all our rooms right now as he comes to bring God's word to us. Thank you so much. It is so good to be here this morning, Faith Bridgers. Good morning, friends. Good morning. Good morning. morning. It's a fall day. (laughs) Fall Sunday, fun Sunday. And I was coming to the church this morning. I've seen, they said it's a kind of a cold. It's fall Sunday, fun Sunday, but it's cold. I saw beautiful ladies wearing boots, coats, and, and scarves, and they said it's cold. It's winter. I said, I came from Chicago. And I'm going back there. (laughs) But it's good. Good for us to be together in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ with friends and families just to be together and enjoy our time together. I wanted to thank Pastor Ken and the leadership team of Faith Bridge. What a partnership. What a ministry they have given to us. Not only they're changing, impacting, blessing the lives around this region, but around the world. Literally around the world. We thank you, Pastor for your leadership and the impact that you are having across the world, especially in India, that what you have done in South Asia uh, several years ago that I felt a burden. I I have a passion that I wanted people to hear the word of God. You know, all of us here must maybe having a Bible or two in your homes, but people on the other side, they don't have Bibles, and some of them can read, some of them can't read, But my passion was that people need to hear the word of God. They need to have a Bible so they can look at the Bible. This is, the Bible says it's a living word of God. When you read the word of God, something will happen to your heart. And my passion was, how do we bring this word to them? So I asked my good friend, Dan Slagle, I said, Dan, would you please help me to make a seminar so that we can give them a basic overview of the Bible. So Dan took time off for four days, and he prepared this curriculum along with his team, and then they came to India. I don't know if you remember this young man then. That's Pastor Dan. (laughs) Don't tell him I said that. He's not here. But uh, he's a great brother, and uh, he came to India. He really, with passion, he prepared a four-day curriculum on basic Bible seminar, and we started teaching people. And people, as they heard, they were so excited. They said, thank you for giving us the word of God. Now we can understand just the basics of the Bible. When we look at the book of Isaiah, we we know what it means a little bit. None of us will know all the Bible in all of our lives, but at least they have a glimpse of the Bible. So we took that and we went to homes of the people. You see the next slide. We started teaching the people, small groups. And then they they started telling others. You see the next slide. Uh, Some of them cannot read and write, so they started taking the proclaimers, the tape recorder, and they would listen to the Word of God. And as they listened to the Word of God, the Bible says... Faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. So as they listened to the word of God, they began to give their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ, and they were willing to take baptism. Friends, 
This is not just a picture for us to see and say, wow, you know, but it's a picture to remind us these believers who were worshiping many gods have turned away and now they serve a living God. And they said, you know, our hearts are now changed. And then I want you to look at the slide. When they're taking this baptism in the water, they are proclaiming to the community, we follow Jesus we also are willing to die for Jesus. There's a price to pay. But Faith Bridge has come alongside, helped us to train the leaders, helped us to help the people with the word of God. Next slide, you will see how the progression has, has been made. Oh, no, only for the glory of God. Today, that small basic Bible seminar that Pastor Dan started, it is now a church planting discipleship movement and a church, another church in Texas came alongside and said, we want to help you. And they started helping us. And because God's grace and mercy, we were able to start 5,800 house churches for the glory of God. And 24,000 new believers, when I say new believers, they never heard of Jesus they came to follow Christ. And more than 3,000 people have taken baptism. Faith Bridgers, Pastor Ken, and the leadership team, thank you so much. Thank you so much for your leadership. And really, we appreciate each one of you for praying for us. God bless you. And uh, let's give a hand to Faith Church. <laughs> this morning, I wanted to share a beautiful text from the Bible. And before I tell that story, I wanted you to uh, listen to a story that I heard. There are three pastors who take a time off for retreat, and all of three of them are very serious and and trying to have a retreat together, praying together for one another. One of the pastors said, you know, guys, I need to confess. I have a problem. I have an issue in my life. I'd like you guys to pray. And he says, you know, my problem is gambling. I leave the church after that, after days, and I just go out and clunk, 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 chung, chung. That's my gambling. Please pray for me. The second guy said, you know, I have a problem. I'm lazy. I don't pray. I don't prepare my sermons. I just copy from other pastors. The third guy looked and he got up and he slowly was leaving the room. And they said, what about you? And he just kept quiet. He said, you need to share with us what's your problem. You need to tell us. You need to confess just like we did. The third guy said, I have a problem of gossip and I just can't wait to get out of the room. Please pray for me. <laughs> All of us have some issues in our life. All of us have some problems in our life. All of us have some brokenness in our life that we cannot fix it ourselves. We need the grace of God to fix. We need the love of Jesus Christ in our hearts to help us. All of us have something that, that's in us, and we, we, we become helpless people. And only God can fix us. Only God is there to help us, to guide us, to lead us. And the, the story that I'm going to read is from John's uh, Gospel, chapter 8. It's a marvelous story. It's an amazing passage if you read it. And... Uh, the ushers are going to pass the Bibles. If you don't have Bibles, please take a Bible, take it home. It's the Word of God. I tell you, you know, when you, when you read the Bible, there's something that will happen to your heart. I've seen this all over the world. When people read the Word of God, something begins to happen in their lives. I've seen it. I know. I have experienced it personally, that the Word of God is so powerful. That's why the Bible says it's a living Word of God. God speaks to us. No one picks up a, a week's newspaper and buys a paper for last week. Nobody does that. You know, we daily want news, everyday news. The Bible is everyday news. It's news for us, the good news for us. And I pray that you will take this Bible with you if you don't have a Bible. But this morning, join with me and I will read it for you. John chapter 8. It's a beautiful story that I want to share with you. Jesus returned to the Mount of Olives. But early the next morning, he was back again at the temple. Can you say the word temple? He was back again at the temple because every time he came back and he spoke, something happened to the hearts of the people. When they listened to Jesus, he spoke like no one else. He spoke with authority. When he spoke the word, something happened to the hearts of the people. So they were eagerly waiting to listen to him. So he was teaching there. A crowd soon gathered, and he sat down and taught them. As he was speaking, the teachers of the religious law and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught 
in the act of adultery, they put her in front of the crowd. Teacher, they said to Jesus, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses says to stone her. What do you say? They were trying to trap him into saying something they could use against him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote in the dust with his finger. He didn't say much. He was silent. He just started writing. They kept demanding an answer. So he stood up again and said, all right. But let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. Then he stooped down again, wrote in the dust. He was silent. When the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest until only Jesus was left. Can you say only Jesus? Jesus. Again, only Jesus. All the crowd left. Only Jesus is with her. Then Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, Woman, where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? Not one of them? The whole crowd was there? Not one of them condemn you? Very quietly she said, No, Lord. Jesus said, Neither do I. Go. Go. And sin no more. Go. Start afresh again. You know, this is a story that, that is so powerful. It, it begins to tell us. It's a, it's a story that this person deserves death. The whole crowd was there. Because according to the law of Moses, they they had to stone her. But Jesus was there. But Jesus was there. You know, every time Jesus comes to a scene, it changes. (laughs) Every situation that you and I face in our life, it's, it's a... It's a difficult time in your life. It's, it's a problematic situation and you feel uh, rejected in your life and you're lonely in your life. When Jesus comes on the scene, it changes. Jesus was there. And the whole crowd that stood around her were shouting death to this person. They were judging her from their perspective, but Jesus was there. <laughs> I love this passage because in the midst of the whole crowd, they were were partly right in casting the stone because the law of Moses said that. But they only caught one person. But here she was, you know, I, I, I just imagine with me this person who stood there all by herself, very lonely. All of a sudden, she's thrust in this crowd, and she's standing there alone. Her head is down, and she's trembling. She's feeling any moment the stones will start hitting my body, my head, my eyes. Probably she's trying to say, how can I cover myself? She's very lonely at this moment. All the crowd that she hears is, stone her, stone her. But only Jesus was very silent. He stood with her. Friends, I want to tell you, when you feel this kind of at times in your life that you're rejected and you're all by yourself and you say, no one understands my pain. No one understood. No one was willing to even give her a chance to say what happened. But everyone was judging her. And there was the Lord Jesus Christ silently observing this whole thing. I want to tell you, Jesus stands with the rejected and the lonely. Everyone else is shouting and and screaming death to this woman. She's rejected, of course, because of the community she lived in. She's very lonely at this point in her journey. And she knows any moment the stones might be just pelting at her and and breaking her bones. And no one knows what's going to happen. No one was standing with her, but Jesus stood by her when she was lonely. You know... Loneliness is a very dreadful feeling. You know, I was surprised to see 
what the surveys was sharing. The survey for more than 2,000 Americans conducted by Harris Poll on behalf of American Osteopathic Association showed that almost three quarters, 72% of Americans experience loneliness. And for many, it's not just once in a while occurrence. One third said they feel lonely at least once a week. Loneliness is very dreadful for us. And our, our society is filled with this loneliness because no one understands, no one has time to listen to each other. We're so busy these days with our texting. We express so much in texting, but no one knows the inner feeling that person is going through. Loneliness is dreadful. It is very painful experience. Not only loneliness, she was also guilty because being caught, she was in the crowd, in the midst of the crowd that were judging her. She was all by herself. It's a very lonely feeling. A 16-year-old said this, I don't feel like I fit in anywhere. I have no friends. I hate being this unhappy, but I can't control it. I feel so alone. Whenever I think about the future, I get scared that I'll always be by myself because I'm not good-looking or funny enough for others. What a lonely feeling that is. You're in the midst of the crowd. You're in the midst of a family, but you know deep inside you, there's, you don't really have a friend who is willing to listen. I want to tell you something the Bible says in Isaiah 53. He says, he was despised, talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. He was despised. He was rejected by mankind. Have you been rejected sometimes in the crowd? Have your friends rejected you? Family rejected you? Your colleagues rejected you? You're all lonely, all by yourself. The Bible says Jesus understands because he says he was despised, he was rejected by mankind. A man of suffering, Jesus knows what is suffering. Not only that, but it goes on further and it says, and familiar with pain. Jesus knows the pain that you and I go through in life. He says he understands that. The whole mob that stood there were wanting to pelt, throw, and put this woman to death. But Jesus stood by this rejected, lonely person. He'll be the only one for you to stand. And you know, I want to tell you, when Jesus stands by you, things will change in your life. And, and this is the story that begins when Jesus was very silent. The law of Moses says, verse 5, the law of Moses says to Stoner, what do you say? What do you say? They were trying to trap him to say something they could use against him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote in the dust with his finger. He was very silent, but he was writing something in the dust. Friends, I want to tell you, sometimes, please understand, when God is silent, he's not rejecting you. When God is silent, he's working the bigger plan for your life. When God is silent, he's working a plan that you and I don't understand. Because in Isaiah 55, 8, he says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither your ways are my ways. That's what the Lord says. His silence was holding the mob. They were just waiting to pelt, to throw the stones on this lady. But as long as Jesus was quiet, they were just holding on. They were screaming, they were shouting, but Jesus didn't say anything. He was silent. God's silence never equals God's absence. Sometimes you pray and you wonder, where is God? Where is God? He's not absent. If he's silent, he's not absent. God's silence never equals inactivity. He is doing something behind the scene. He is consistently working behind the scenes of our lives for our good, for his glory. You need to wait sometimes. And he was very quietly writing on this dust. When God gives you an answer, no, keep in mind that there is a much greater yes behind it. Don't rush God. God is working. And I'm sure this lady is standing there painfully wondering what is going to happen. She hears the crowd saying, death, death, death. And here she's waiting what Jesus would do. He's very silent. But he's active. He's doing something. He's writing her history. His no is not a rejection, but a redirection for her life and your life. Sometimes we need to just wait. Sometimes we need to just wait. Jesus was on, the, on, the, on this 
dust writing something. And then I, I studied quite a few commentaries to know what he was writing. No one really knows what he was writing. Nobody really knows what he was writing, but he was writing something. With the same finger that he was writing on the dust, the same finger he wrote the Ten Commandments. And I believe with the same finger, he's writing your history, your future, if you give him a chance. And he was writing probably her future. I don't know. But one, th- one commentator said, probably he was writing in the dust. You know, the Bible says all the religious leaders stood there. They watched him writing. And as soon as they see the writing, one by one, step back. One by one, step back. And one commentator said, probably he was writing the names of the Pharisees' girlfriends. <laughs> Who knows what he was writing? He must have wrote something. You know, last Saturday, you were there, my friend, Mr. Pharisee. <laughs> and, and they looked at that and one by one, step back. One by one, step back. Jesus' silence was protecting her. When God is silent, don't think he's not doing something on your behalf. You need to wait sometimes. What, what, what is he really saying to us is, you know, surrender your life into his hands. You know, he just says, you know, God, you know, you and I try to fix our lives. We try to solve our problem. And I think a, a personality that is always trying to go, go, go getting, you want to solve everything by yourself. And God says, some things you cannot solve. The sin in your life, the anger that is beyond you, the hatred that is beyond you, you cannot fix it. You and I know that it's a frustrating thing in our lives. And he's waiting for you to come and say, you know, I want to just surrender to God. I need God's help to forgive people, to let go this anger in my life, this frustration in my life. I can't fix it. I need to come to him. And he's waiting. He's waiting. He says, you know, come to me and I will give you rest. I, I met a young man. And this is a true testimony. The young man met me and he said, you know, Pastor, I started drinking one glass of alcohol. Then I switched to one bottle a day. Long story, long testimony. I'm going to just shorten it for you. He said, then I was, I was not getting kick in my life. That's what he said. I was not getting kick in my life. He said, I took the bottle. I took the drugs, mixed it together. And after some time, that wasn't giving me kick enough. And then he pulled his pants up a little bit and he started showing. I saw the marks of all the needles. He said, I started injecting in my body. Then he stood up and he says, you won't believe what I did next. I said, no, no, tell me what you did. He said, I started taking snake venom into my body. And he said, finally, I knew I was going to die. Then someone introduced me to the Lord. I had to come and surrender my life to the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, when I did that, my life began to change. My friends, this morning, I want to assure you, there are some issues in your life that you cannot handle by yourself. You need the grace of God. You need the help of God. And this is a picture that we see that God is willing. Jesus was more than willing to help this woman come out of a situation of death into life. That's what begins to happen to this young person. Someone, I I, I read a nice story that Model T car, some of you young people won't remember, but Model T was invented by Henry Ford, the first, first motor car. And one day, one of the cars was stalled on the road, and the guy was doing everything possible. He was a mechanic himself, but he couldn't get the car started. Then he says, a limousine was going by, and he, a gentleman stopped, and he looked at this car that was dead, not moving. And the gentleman got out of this limousine, walked up to the car. He says, I looked at the car. He said, I know what the problem is. You sit inside the car. When I tell you to start, you start. The guy said, I tried everything and never started. He said, you sit down, I'll tell you what. He sat in the car, and this gentleman, older gentleman, fixed something, and he said, now you start the car. And the car cranked. The guy got out of the car, and he says, sir, I did everything. Who are you? He says, I'm Henry Ford. I know how to fix the cars. (laughs) God knows how to fix you. God knows how to fix your problem. Sometimes you think you can do it. You tried everything in your life, and you never fixed it yourself. And you're still trying it. Give it up. Give it up. Be still and know that I'm God. The Hebrew word, be still, really means stop striving. Stop striving. Let it go. Surrender to God. That's what it really means. 
Be still means let it go. Give it in the hands of God. He's more than willing to help you to come out of these situations. That's what God wants us to do. And Jesus forgives. Jesus forgives this woman completely. He says, you know, woman, where are your accusers? When he says woman, it's not just a term that is just a term that is kind of a derogatory term. But really, it's a respectful word in in the Eastern culture. He used the same word to call his mother from the cross. When he was on the cross, he looked at his mother. He says to his mother, Mother, there is your son. He was talking about John the disciple. And he uses the same word. He gives her the respect. You know, the Bible says, He who knew no sin was made sin for us. Jesus never knew sin, but he took our sin. He looks at this woman, he says, neither do I condemn you. Go. Go. Live a new life. Make a U-turn in your life. Start living a life. You know, you and I try to live our lives in our own way. We struggle so much in our lives. But God says, be still. We don't know how to be still these days. Even before we go to sleep, we want to look who texted me. We look at our phones. We cannot be still any longer. The more gadgets we are, the more restless we are. I pray this morning that you will say, you know, I want to be still before God. I can't fix my children. I can't fix my husband. I can't fix my wife. I can't fix my life. I'm just going to surrender. This morning, I'm praying that you will understand the grace and the love of God that he wants to give each one of us a new beginning, a new life. Some of you, some of you have been to church, been in relationship with God, then you turned your back. This morning, I want to give you an opportunity to come back and say, yes, Lord, I want to rededicate, recommit my life to you. This is what God does. He wants to give us another chance in our life. I pray this morning, as you receive the forgiveness, go and forgive others. Because you and I don't have strength to forgive others. The anger, the frustrations in our life, the, the things that people have done to us, it happened to all of us, including your preacher this morning. Sometimes it's hard to forgive people, but you turn to the cross of Jesus Christ and say, Lord, I receive your forgiveness. Give me the grace this morning that I may go back and forgive others. I may love others. Jesus is willing, more than willing, I should say, to give you a new life, a new chance, a new beginning. If someone said this so well, only Jesus can turn a mess into a message. Only Jesus can take a test and turn it into a testimony for you. Only Jesus can take a trial and turn it into a triumph. Only Jesus can take a victim and give her victory for the life. Only Jesus. And this he does it, giving his life on the cross for you and for me. That is where the new beginning happens for all of us. I want to pray. I want to pray for you. I want to pray with you this morning. There are some of you are sitting and wrestling in your life. I can't forgive. My life is really messed up. I can't fix myself. This is a beautiful moment for you to say, Lord, I surrender my life to you. Lord, here it is. Take it. I can't handle it anymore. Some of you are feeling, I'm so lonely. Pastor, you're right. I'm so lonely in my life. This is a moment for you to know that Jesus will come besides you and he will give you his friendship. He says, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone opens the door, I will come. I will have supper and fellowship with you. The Lord Jesus Christ. I'm willing to come to you, he says. He says, if you hear my voice, open the door of your heart. I want to pray with you. Please let us bow our heads in word of prayer. And all of you sitting here this morning that are struggling in your life, the issues that you're facing. Lord Jesus, I want to surrender my life to you. 
I want to give my issues to you, my problems to you. Friends, I want to pray. I want to pray with you this morning. If there is anyone in here who says, Pastor, please pray for me. Please pray for me. If you can just raise your hand wherever you're seated. Wherever you're seated, raise your hand and say, Pastor, please pray for me. God bless you. God bless you. Wherever you are, just say, yes, Lord, I need, I need your grace. I need your help. God bless you. Anywhere that you're seated, just lift up your hand and I will pray with you this morning. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you, Lord God. And Father, our hearts are broken, our lives are broken, families are broken. Some of us, we cannot even express the pain to our own family life, our own family members. We cannot express, oh God. But you are here in our midst this morning. You understand our situation. You know the pain. You know the struggles. You know the challenges that each one of us is facing, oh Lord. There is nothing that we can hide from you, my Lord. Touch, oh Father, this morning. Lord, touch each one of us anew this morning. Give us the grace to begin our journeys anew again. Give us, oh God, that love that we can start afresh again. Lord, we surrender ourselves to you. We thank you this morning for giving us this grace that you are a God that forgive us. When people want to shout death upon us, you shout life into us, oh God. We thank you, Father. When people try to destroy our lives you give us hope my lord you're the only one you're the only one that can do that for us this morning we commit oh god our lives to you we thank you as we surrender our lives to you in jesus name we ask and we pray amen welcome to postscript here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Welcome to Postscript. My name is Michael Sullivan, business administrator here at FaithBridge, and I'm joined by Peter Pereira, a missionary from Hope for Today, Ministries in India. We're so glad that you're here, and thanks for bringing us a great word this morning, uh, talking about how God is in control. Thanks for being here, Peter. Thank you. Well, uh, I know in your message today, you it was a beautiful message, really talking about how uh, Jesus enters in uh, to our loneliness, and I loved at the end, you were kind of saying, you know, Jesus is the only person who can take a test and turn it into a testimony, uh, a mess and turn it into a message, just a real encouragement uh, to everyone that, that Jesus is where our hope is. Um, but you know, as, as someone who's been walking uh, with the Lord for a long time, or, or maybe that Christian who's been in the room, maybe the tendency is to say, yeah, but, um, Jesus, but, but what else? I mean, you know, uh, how do I, you know, this, this world is so broken. Is just Jesus? I mean, how do I, this, this, the people you talked about with the, the snake venom and all this crazy stuff that's happening, is there something else or, or just Jesus? Well, there is a starting with Jesus mm -hmm. and it ends with Jesus and it's a journey. Yes. It's a journey. Okay. It's not just Jesus. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is Jesus, but it's a journey with Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so I think one of the things that we need to understand when we are surrounded by friends who are not following Christ, mm -hmm. It's very important for us, those who know the Lord, not to judge other people, mm. not to condemn them. Right. You know, we learn from this story that Jesus did not condemn. And he was mm. the only one in that crowd who had the right to condemn her. Mm. He right. was the only one that right. could have stoned her. Mm -hmm. But he did not. Mm. He balanced that by reminding us that the grace and the love of God is very important. Mm. He did not tell her, it's okay to go and live the life where you're living. But right. he says, you know, go and sin no more. Mm -hmm. Go and don't mess up your life. That's what he was saying. Mm -hmm. So I don't know when people say it's just Jesus or no, it begins with Jesus. It ends with Jesus. Mm -hmm. He who began a good work in you shall also complete it. Mm -hmm. So it's a journey with Jesus. Right. You just don't come on a scene one day with Jesus and it's over. Mm -hmm. It's a journey to walk yeah. with Him. Yeah. And it's not easy, but we need to keep walking. Mm -hmm. We fall, but He will help us to rise up again. Mm -hmm. He's the only one that can help us. Yeah. You know, that's the key thing for us to remember, not to condemn, not to criticize people, mm -hmm. 
but to help them to see mm -hmm. that God is so gracious towards us. Yeah. That's good. That's what it, it means for us. Yeah, that's good. I, I think a lot of times it is difficult, you know, uh, when you are a believer and, and you see sin and that's no longer a part of your life to uh, be overwhelmed or, or, or to judge. But you see Jesus, a great example of walking into the scene and, and he knows her past, uh, just like he knows the past of the Pharisees. Uh, but he meets her where she is and shows love and grace and then says, now go leave your life. Uh, of sin and, and, and live a new life, like you said. So that's good. That's helpful. Thank you, Peter. Uh, kind of switching gears a little bit away from the message, let's talk about your ministry, uh, Hope for Today, and your partnership with ILI. And, and maybe, I know you shared a little bit about the 5,800 uh, house churches and the 24,000 people who have come to know Christ, which is all amazing and fantastic. But but tell the people a little bit, how does that take place? Um, what are What is your ministry doing over in India specifically? The key thing for us in the work that we're doing is to train the people. Mm -hmm. And I think this is the model that Jesus did. He was training the people. Right. We are aggressively helping people understand what the Bible teaches on leadership. Okay. We have these eight core values mm -hmm. from International Leadership Institute. Mm -hmm. The first conference was done in India. Huh. And now within uh, 17 years, we are more than in 60 countries wow. and all the partners are working. Mm -hmm. God's hand is on this material. Mm -hmm. God's hand is on uh, Dr. Wes mm -hmm. and Joy Griffin. They're yes. the ones who started this. And I was with them from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. But these eight core values, very simple. Mm -hmm but yet it touches the hearts of the people. When they listen in a class, mm -hmm. they come with great expectation, thinking that we're gonna teach them something, rocket science to be a leader. Mm -hmm. But the first core value is to teach them to say, do we have an intimate relationship with God? Mm -hmm. If I'm a leader, if I'm gonna lead God's people, mm -hmm. it's not about leading people. Do I have a right relationship with God? Mm -hmm. Am I intimate with God? Am I walking with him so I can lead his people? Mm -hmm. So when they listen to that such core values, mm -hmm. they begin to realize that I never thought like this. Mm. You know, in my own journey, I'm a workaholic. Mm. I think the more I do for God, I'm with God. But working for God, mm -hmm. being with God is two different things. Yes. So if I spend more time with him, I can get more done mm -hmm. in a shorter time. And I realized this in the last, uh, you know, few couple of years, mm -hmm. that being with Him is more important. Mm -hmm. It's good work. And God began to multiply the work. So we are aggressively training people, helping them to become mm -hmm. excellent leaders yeah. to serve God. And that's, that's the calling that we have. So eight core values on the leadership model, we teach people to do mm -hmm. that. And I actually had the opportunity to go to Siliguri, India this summer, and I know um, probably people would be interested in who, who are coming to these classes. Is this pastors or um, who are the people that you're inviting to these conferences and teaching these eight core values to? We're inviting pastors, lay leaders, anyone that is a Christian wants to serve the Lord. Mm. And I think when people understand these eight core values, they become an excellent leader. Mm -hmm. Because I think the eight core values speaks to the hearts of the people. Mm -hmm. And we tell them, we're not, I tell my team, I said, you know, we're not just going there sharing the notes. We don't do that. Mm -hmm. I tell my team, I said, you know, we need to practice this. When we teach, it is coming out. We are pouring from inside out. It's mm -hmm. not the notes. Right. You know, we, we always feel we, we can never meet the mark of being intimate with God. Mm -hmm. Though, you know, as the deer panted for the water, so my soul longeth. I mean, mm -hmm. we keep longing for more and more. Mm -hmm. But I think those eight core values help us to become great leaders. You know, if you're close to the Lord, do you have passion for the lost as a leader? Mm -hmm. You're a leader. You know, most people think leader being leaders are boss, mm -hmm. getting things done. Yeah. And I've reached to a place in my ministry, but really, are you reaching the lost? What is your role in reaching the lost? Mm -hmm. How are you helping the least and the lost? Mm -hmm. What's your role? You may not be a preacher, but do you have this passion in you mm -hmm. to help the people, to see the lost come to know Christ, to help the least mm -hmm. know the Lord? So these are some of the challenges we are teaching people, yeah. and it is really revolutionizing uh, the leaders. Yeah, they get so excited and 
And really what, what's neat is you teach them this curriculum and then you're empowering them to be able to take the curriculum back and, and teach others as well in their towns and their villages, right? Exactly. That's what we do this as a national conference mm -hmm. and then we ask them to go and do a regional conference in their own language. Mm -hmm. Now I think in India we have about seven or eight languages we translated this That's book. That's amazing. That's amazing. Uh, and you know, people love to hear in their language. It's mm -hmm. the heart language. Sure. And they hear in their language, you know, about leadership and the core values. Mm -hmm. they're, they're stirred up. I've seen people in their tribal places, tribal mm -hmm. people, wow. their hearts are stirred up. Mm -hmm. uh, and so amazing testimonies yeah. we are hearing from people. Yeah, it was really neat being in Siliguri because it's it's way up in that top right corner of India that's near Nepal and Bhutan and, and even not far from China, which yes. I was amazed by. And so you're right. We, I think it was the first actually national conference where um, I think there were four languages, four or five languages being, or countries represented and thus four or five different languages. And then so cool the last night, uh, some guys came in and they each got to perform, you know, kind of a, a, a signature to their country. And yes. so it's just a really neat cultural experience. And again, knowing, okay, these people, when we train them, are now about to go out and, and multiply. And yes. that's really exciting. Um, what other things are you excited about? What are you looking forward to as you think about maybe even looking into 2018? What are some exciting things uh, that your ministry is pushing towards? We are pushing now towards the younger generation that mm. is so eager to want to serve the Lord. Mm. I've met some graduates from engineering colleges and other places. They somehow feel tugged to serve the Lord. Huh. Uh, they want to go and serve the Lord. I don't know how to explain what it means. A calling is so personal, so mm. individual from the Lord, but they're eager to serve the Lord. I was in a conference the other day in India where I was speaking to about 4,000 young people. Huh. They were packed. They came from 10 different states to one small town, hmm. really small town. And God gave me the grace and a privilege to speak to them and they were just thrilled to hear hmm. the journey for the younger generation. So we are praying that younger generation would be excited because it's a time that they be recognized that God is moving in the mm -hmm. lives of the younger generation. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's the time for the younger generation to take up the baton and to start running. Yeah, that's exciting. That's really cool. So are you doing that through your History Makers Conference or how are you reaching the younger generation? Through History Makers Conference primarily and mm -hmm. through other meetings that I go to churches to speak to the younger generations. I'm addressing this and asking them to take up the load yeah. and to lead this uh, ministries for the younger mm. generation. It's a little hard for the older generation to give room, mm. uh, especially in the culture that we live in. It's not easy for people to give room for the younger generation. Yeah. You know, that's my prayer that we start getting out of the way of our journeys and giving room for the younger generation so they can do mm -hmm. wonderful things. These young kids can do wonderful things, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm just eager, anxious, eagerly waiting for these younger guys to come on board yeah. and do the ministries. That's great. I mean, when you have the wisdom of the old with the energy of the young, there really is, it's God can do some fusion. great things. That's <laughs> awesome. Well, Peter, it's always a treat to have you here. Uh, just such a blessing to have you here on this Fall Fun Day Sunday, and, and thank you for being here with us at PostScript. So thank you. Thank it. you so much. It's always a blessing to be at Faith Bridge. Absolutely. And thank you for tuning in today. We'll be back next week uh, with Ben Stewart as we continue on uh, in this fall season. So thanks for being here and goodbye. Thanks for joining us for PostScript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org slash postscript.